Welcome to the Virtual Ventures Podcast, episode 22. I'm your host, Andres Sanchez. Our guest is Connor Gross, a true entrepreneurial trailblazer. He sold an e-com company for seven figures at 22 and currently runs two seven-figure companies in e-com and land. With a $5 million portfolio of storage facilities, Connor's journey is one of remarkable success. Get ready to be inspired as we explore entrepreneurship and strategic investments with Connor Gross. Continue to help us book amazing guests like Connor by doing something as simple as liking, commenting, and subscribing to our podcast. We really appreciate your continued support, and we hope you enjoy this episode. Connor, how we doing, man? Thanks for coming on. Of course. I'm glad that to, uh, to be on the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, for sure. I'm really excited to talk with you. You popped up on my feed on Twitter a, a good amount of times recently, and I feel like that's just the way I've been finding guests lately. If, if you're popping up on my feed, you're doing something interesting. So I'm um, really excited to, to get you on the show. And for everybody watching, you know, we go right into things. Connor, who are you? What have you accomplished up to this date? And um, give us a little background on how you got there. Yeah, man. Happy to. Uh, so basically, a little bit of my background. 26 now, living in New York City. Um, I'll, I'll probably just kick off the story, I guess, beginning of college. So I feel like that's when kind of started doing some uh, some entrepreneurial stuff. So uh, I went to school up in Boston, started college back in 2016. Uh, when I went up there, started an e-commerce business with a buddy of mine. We were just selling cell phone accessory products all across like Amazon or our own site as well. Um, did that for pretty much the four years throughout school, scaled that up, did a couple million in sales, and then ended up selling that a couple months just before graduating. So like money hit the bank account on that business, probably like February 20th of 2022. So like, like money hit the bank account and everyone's like, then you start hearing COVID whispers and whatnot. Um, so it hit that it, money hit the bank account. And then we went on spring break, came back, school was canceled. And we sat around for the next year, pretty much bored out of our minds. Um, after that, I started another e-commerce business. I've been running that with one of my partners right now. It's in the boat and the automotive space. And I've pretty much scaled that up now. I have a pretty decent sized team in place there. And from all like the uh, the sale proceeds from our last business, started buying self-storage throughout Texas with my partner who I ran that business with as well. So um, between those two, definitely keep my time busy. And on top of that, just used to run a podcast, write a newsletter now. Just like fun stuff to meet interesting people like yourself. Yeah, for sure. I mean... I love how you just glazed over. Yeah, I did a couple million in sales there in college. Um, that's an unreal accomplishment and congratulations on being able to achieve that at such a young age. We've had a few e-com people on, so I'm always curious. Like, E-commerce is this kind of mystical world where you see people like yourself making millions of dollars. Um, but for people listening, if you've tried, you know it's not as easy as it seems when you're watching people like yourself. And then if you haven't tried, it is not as easy as it seems when you see people like Connor pulling in millions of dollars in sales. How did you decide that e-commerce was going to be the play? Like what kind of piqued your interest in that? So the conversation back in 2016 basically started around my, uh, both myself and one of my partners, Giovanni, we come from entrepreneurial families. And so his dad mo owned like uh, everything from strip, uh, strip malls to mobile home parks and condo developments and all of that kind of stuff. So he came from a real estate background. My parents uh, are in the candle manufacturing space. So between those awesome. two, like we just were like, we want to start a business. And when we were 18 and 19 years old, we actually just did not give a shit what the business was. We were like, we just want to go and sell stuff. Um, and so after probably like a month or two of just brainstorming whatever we wanted to do, realized like a lot of the easy like chop sheets, like phone cases and cell phone accessories that they were giving out during freshman orientation were pretty easy to go and manufacture overseas. And so I thought it was like, let's just go and sell a piece. Like truthfully, zero idea of what we were doing, no product market research, nothing. We we're like, people are buying it, let's sell it. Um, and it probably took us, like we ordered 2000, basically like the stick on the back of your phone wallet, where you could mm -hmm. hold like cash, keys, cards, all that stuff. Yep. Uh, we ordered 2000 of them over from China. And we we're like, we're just gonna sell these to all of our friends. And then we quickly realized, oh shit, we do not have 2000 friends. <laughs> um, and so, and so between that, we were like, okay, like, let's go sell them at events. We went to the Boston marathon one year and tried to sell them there and we sold one, literally one. Um, 
and we're like, all right, that's pretty disheartening. Let's try to sell them on our website. And, you know, we're like, oh, shit, getting Facebook ad traffic is, like, really expensive, and we don't sell an expensive product. We're like, how about we go and try Etsy? We're like, oh, this is kind of working. Like, we're using some of Etsy's traffic. And then finally we tried Amazon, and Amazon ended up being kind of like the bread and butter for that business for the next four years. So kind of take me through, I mean, it's it's not that easy to just jump on Amazon and start selling, and you tried all of these different avenues. What were some of the challenges that came with deciding Facebook doesn't work, Pinterest or Etsy is okay, and then you went and Amazon was the home run. Like kind of what, what was that process like? It's really just about the cost of traffic. So like if we're selling a $10 product and our product costs are so minimal, right? So it's like our product costs are 30 cents. Like we're selling cheap phone accessories. Yeah. Um, so like you have a 98% gross margin or whatever the math is on that. And we're like, okay, what about shipping? Two, to, two bucks to ship this thing. So it's still not that expensive. What about like picking and packing it from a 3PL? Okay, another two bucks. So we're like, great. Our profit margin is $5. Can we acquire a customer on Facebook for $5? And then if we did that, we break even, which sucks. Uh, so we're like, no, we can't go and acquire a customer on Facebook for that, which means that we can't go and tell enough people about the brand, which means that we can't sell this on our own website. So with Etsy, we were like, let's go and put this up here and realize that we didn't have to pay for the traffic. So that $5 profit margin, that was ours, right? Like we could take that. Now with Amazon in particular, it's quite literally Etsy just at scale. And so by listing on Amazon, yeah, I think we did, uh, I actually kind of forget the sales. It's a couple of tens of thousands that first year on Amazon. Uh, and then we we're like, oh, we have something here. And then we ended up working on it a little bit more full time during college. Awesome. What was it like to sell a company at 22? Like not the business side, the fun part of things. You said the money hit the account in February. What did that feel like? What did you do with the money post sale? Like, I want to know a little more about that. Yeah, it was, no, it's fun as fuck. Uh, I think the cool part for <laughs> us uh, was that like none of our friends knew we were. It was a big business. Um, so all of our friends were like, "Gio and Connor, they do this cute little like cell phone accessory thing," and we just never corrected them because like, why bother? Um, and then we sold it, and we got like a Forbes article, and it was like talking about how we sold millions and stuff. And everyone's like, wait, what were you doing? Like, like I thought this was just like something you made some, some beer money for them on the weekends. Um, so I think that part was kind of fun. In terms of what we did with the money, like we didn't have a ton of opportunity to like really ball out, I guess, because the world shut down. Um, yeah. I actually remember like our closing dinner, we went to like a dumpling sushi night or whatever like that. And it was like discounted dumplings for the like 25 cent dumplings. Uh, so like still, still didn't spend anything crazy. We honestly just kind of like, sat on that cash for a lot of 2020 until 2021 came around and we were like let's go and start buying some real estate um but in terms of like the fun stuff like i don't know my, my partner and i like we love to travel so i think we've been to like 35 40 countries like part Amazing. of uh being in college meant like we got to go and work in these co-ops at my school and so like we convinced the school to give us six months off full time and just grow that business and like during that time we went from doing like 150,000 in sales to 850,000 and we're like, okay, we've got something here. Um, so we were able to scale up the business really substantially, but yeah, once we sold it, I think the big thing for me that I realized and anyone listening to this who wants to get into e-commerce, whatever, if you don't have a lot of cash flow and you, like, you need cash flow and you want to start your own thing, don't start an e-commerce company because the reality is like, we sold that business and that was the first time our bank account looked full in like four years because what a lot of people don't realize is if you are successful and you are growing in the e-commerce world, you just put 100% of that money back into inventory. And so I would highly recommend starting another business if, if you want to. Um, but yeah, that's it from, uh, from the sales standpoint. Interesting question here that just came across my mind as we talk about this is e-commerce actually somewhat benefited from COVID when everybody was locked down at home. Do you think it was better that you sold pre-COVID? Do you think you could have made more money um, if you would have held on during that COVID e-commerce spike, like, have you thought about that? I have thought about it. Two things that I think really negatively impacted it. One is shipping from China. Mm -hmm. Every freight carrier was backed up. All of the manufacturers were shut down. So there was zero supply chain. We couldn't have gotten more products. And secondly, think back to COVID, right? Board games blew up. Like being able to go and buy poker sets and things like that blew up because everyone was just stuck inside and didn't know what to do. No one's buying wallets. No one's like, yeah. damn, you know what I really need right now? Oh, you know what I really need right now? A new phone case. Like, cause you're just not going anywhere. You don't need it. So 
No, I think we made the, absolutely the right decision. Um, and I also think that I was very happy personally to be done selling on Amazon by that point. I was kind of over it. Um, just too much platform risk and I wanted to kind of diversify and start investing in things that I thought had a little bit better of a chance of surviving in the long term. I think maybe something cool for you to take us through because I know, I mean, at least for me and I'm sure everybody else, when you start your business, you think about that exit, you think about what that situation is going to look like. Was it just you and your business partner negotiating the terms for the sale of the company? Um, were you guys working with third parties? What was, what was that experience? So we worked with a business broker and truthfully from my experience, I thought they were not the best business broker in the world. So I actually won't name their, I won't name the name right now. Um, I just thought that like they did a very low effort and like the value that they provided was in having an email list and having somewhat of a brand. But the reality is that, like, we, it took us nine months to sell the business. And when the person came along who we wanted to buy it, like the transaction I actually went pretty smoothly. Um, and that wasn't, a testament to the business broker. It was just the individual who was buying us was like a very easy to work with individual. Um, I think that I would have probably, if I had to do it in hindsight, I probably would have done the same thing. The only qualm I have with it is like, I just take a high fee. And so I probably would have tried to negotiate the rates a little bit more to stick with them. Um, but I think the the big thing for us, and this is what, what I would recommend to anyone, especially if you're younger and starting a business, is it was really nice to have a win at the age of 22. To have a win, to have a, like a bank full, filled with cash, like a nice article to kind of reference next time you need to go and raise capital or next time you need to go and like recruit employees. Like having that win definitely goes and like adds credibility to you at a young age. And so for us, the money at the time is life changing. Now, the question is like, if I had, if I owned that same exact business today um, and I had sold a previous one, I would not sell because like the money would not be life changing at this point. Like nothing in my life would change by getting that same amount of cash. But at the time when I was still in undergrad and hadn't even graduated yet, it was absolutely life-changing money. So just to follow up on that, what would you, what would be some tips you would give to a 20-year-old, a 21, 22-year-old, or even somebody 18, 19, just getting out of high school who wants to get into business and wants to jump in and go get that first win under their belt? What would be some just baseline tips you would give somebody? I would start something that would give you cash from day one and skills. So uh e like i don't know i i sound pretty hypocritical here having started an e-commerce business and sold it and also running another e-commerce business right now but i wouldn't start an e-commerce business if you are strapped for cash and you have never run a business before it's just hard people see the sexiness of like the marketing and all that stuff nobody thinks about the back-end logistics fulfilling customer support etc um so i personally would not start one if somebody's young and listening to this and wants to go and start something for themselves i would highly recommend just starting an agency business that can focus on learning a skill. And I think that's pretty generic and cliche advice, but it's the truth because fast forward four years from now, you start an email marketing business and you're commoditized service and I get it and it's frustrating, whatever, but you can be world-class in performance marketing, email marketing, SEO, whatever, in three to four years time, you can develop a book of business where you are just essentially change, exchanging your time in the beginning for cash and develop a really nice cash flow and then after that four years, if you're done with it, then you can sell the agency and you don't get the highest equity multiple, but you will have developed cash flows and skills along the entire time. And then you can take the skills and apply it into a higher equity business after you sell the business and use the cash to be reinvested into that. I am in full agreement. I think learning these as like somebody who's owned companies in the past and then somebody who is now interviewed a lot of people who have owned companies. Marketing is one of the hardest or the hardest part of the part, like the growth part of the business where you start to make the actual money. And if you can go in and learn these skills and you can go and understand email marketing, understand how to run ads, understand how to acquire customers, which are all agency-based skills, you then can start your own product if you want. Then you can launch that sexy e-commerce site that you've wanted to, to get started. But learning those skills and putting cash in your pocket early on, like you said, trading your time for money, which is something that's going to come with being new and, and having to pave your own path, I think is is a great point of advice for people listening. Yeah, I mean, even even stuff like this, like with this podcast right now, do you edit all your stuff? I personally do not edit all my stuff um, right now. Um, just don't have the time for it. But I'm fortunate to have budget and, and a team that I can go out and hire. But 
it, no, but, but it cost, but it cost me money. No, right, but I was going to say that's literally my point. Is like some 18-year-old yeah. kid could be listening to this right now, and if you had said yes, which I know a lot of podcast producers will go and edit their own stuff, like you can turn around and say, hey, for 500 bucks a month, I'll go and do all of your stuff. And it's work, but it's work on your own accord, and eventually you build up a big enough book of business that you can start hiring somebody and then train them how to edit it. Like that's that's really the name of the game. Um, as as a side note, what do you do? Like, what kind of business do you run? Um, I don't run. I don't operate the companies anymore. But in college, I was I got started with selling sneakers. I love sneakers. They cool. were expensive. Found out I could flip them. Turn that into a six figure a year business. And then nice. on top of that, built a community on Discord around sneaker software and how to rent and utilize it. Grew that to another six figure business. Unfortunately, COVID absolutely derailed me. Um, but I look back and it was like such an amazing learning experience. And in the moment I was living the dream, like you 20, 21, 22, making a lot of money living at home in Miami, life was really good. Um, but then things completely turned and like, fortunately enough, I had invested 50% of the profits into the stock market and I had built a great portfolio of long-term investment. So when things hit the fan, it wasn't a complete zero, but it was, it was hard, um, where like going back, I wish I would have maybe specialized in a skill and not done this whole like big ordeal. Because looking back, I I can't really other than like cool stories that I can talk about and experiences I can share. There's not like a set skill that I developed during that period other than good business acumen, which I think I had prior where if I would have specialized or, or worked hard, I, I could have been able to like drill down on something I could have been able to keep pushing that forward. I don't know. I would I would still say that like the fact that you ran the Discord, right? Like you built up the ability to understand how to attract people to that, how to go and manage community. Like even the sneaker flipping itself sounds like you've probably always been a hustler, but I feel like there's a difference between being a hustler and then actually executing. And when you execute, then you're able to go and build confidence that you can go and do that again in another niche. Like the reality is like when it comes to a lot of like business building stuff, most ideas work. It's just about how you want to go and make them work and what time horizon you have for them. Um, so I don't know. I feel like you probably built up more intangible skills than maybe you might think, whether it's sales, marketing, or community building. Uh, but yeah, I would I would just recommend to anybody who's listening to this that wants to start something, try to go after a skill-based uh, service. You're just going to go learn more and make more earlier on. If you have cash flow and eventually maybe a win, an exit, whatever, you can reinvest into things that have longer time horizons. 100%. I was looking through your tweets um, before the episode and I saw that you tweeted, today I'm excited to launch a product. And then the title of the product was how to quit your job and not run out of money. Oh yeah. I'm, in, I'm interested in hearing a little more about that. Um, I know it was you, yeah, t- explain it to me because you're gonna do better than I would. I gotcha. Um, yeah, so I started this product because I've always been interested in the idea of selling a digital product, just didn't really know what I wanted to do. And so I wanted to give it a shot. So I bought the domain name howtoquityourjob.co. And basically the whole thesis around it is I sold this business, had seven figures in the bank. And when it came time to graduate, I was sitting around and all of my friends were getting jobs and I didn't have another business idea. And my bank account was only draining every single month because I was just spending money and no more money was coming in. And I was really bored. And so I was like, what do what, I should just get a job right now? I was like, I have no idea what to do. I don't have a business that I'm working on. Like, what should I do? I hit up an old manager that I used to have at a software company that I worked at in Boston. And I was like, can I just work for you? He had just gotten the CMO job um, at this e-commerce software business. I really like the guy. I think he's really smart. Or I think he is really smart. Um, and I like the industry of e-commerce in general. So I was like, let me just work for you until I figure out my next thing. And then once I figure out my next thing, you know, I might just jump. So I got that job, uh, worked there for like nine months, got some value out of it and then ended up bouncing. But that whole time when working there, I was like, damn, I can very much just see how people can just get sucked into this. It was an easy lifestyle, easy paycheck, week to week, right? Whatever. Um, it's, it's not a bad life. But what I quickly realized being further out from college is nearly all of my friends just don't like their jobs that much. Uh, and, and this is not an episode to try to go and like shit on jobs or anything like that. Like if you like your job and you like your team, that's awesome. Like keep working on it. If you don't like your job, but like you like the idea of like having the stability um, or not having to go and, like wear every single hat in a business, like work at another job, right? Like not downplaying that at all. I just found that a lot of my friends personally were miserable. And over the last two years, I would do some consulting calls and I would be on calls with my friends and like eventually just convinced like, I don't know, a dozen or two people, uh, like two dozen people to go and quit their jobs and work for themselves. And I think through that process, I kind of quickly learned like, 
there are ways to go and think about how to go and quit your job and work for yourself that not a lot of people talk about. Uh, and it's like, it's a more straightforward path than you might actually expect. And so I think I wanted to go and take every single thing that I learned from those consulting calls, from calls with my friends, and kind of bottle it up and package it into a digital product that'll go and show people the path. Because I think what a lot of people realize, or the story and narrative that I hear from a lot of people is, I want to quit my job, but I don't know, right? And I think like that's the, the most obvious thing. This product does not go and tell you what to do, but it does show you a pretty clear framework for how much money you need before you quit. Should you even quit in the first place? When you go and decide to quit, what like what should you spend your time doing? And it's like, the reality is if you're like a biomechanical engineer, you probably shouldn't quit your job and start an email marketing agency, like probably easier and better ways for you to go make money. Um, but I just have like 18 different case studies that I can go and show you how you can go and uh, do the same, like quit your job and work for yourself. And, uh, and the other thing is like five different things that you can do before you ever quit your job. So that way you kind of de-risk the path of entrepreneurship. And then when did you launch that? How can people go and buy it? Um, and what does it cost? Oh yeah, I launched it last month. Uh, you, they can just buy it pretty easily at howtoquityourjob.co and it costs a uh, hundred bucks. Awesome, perfect. I think that's super useful. And I know the course business or something like that gets a lot of bad rap, but I think this is a great idea, a unique idea. And I do agree. I'm we're we're pretty close in age, and I've got tons of uh, friends who hate their job. Um, mm -hmm. And it's funny because those are also the people who have never been able to understand when I talked about like, oh, I made money online today. Like, oh, I make money online. And I'm always like, if you really hate it, like you're really young, go live at home and go try and start something cool. We have so many tools. We have mm -hmm. the ability to literally do almost anything we want at this point in life with the internet. And they just don't get it. So like, I feel like a course like yours, something visual, case studies for them to read is, is super impactful. So that'll also be linked in the bio below for anybody who wants to go check that out. Um, I think it'll be super helpful. Yeah, I want to talk. And I, yeah, and I was just gonna say quickly, like on the digital course product business, I will say I never would have put myself as the type of person to do that maybe a year or two ago. Um, I actually really like the idea of not making money on my name, but like owning a bunch of companies that nobody even knows that I own to go and shop with them. Uh, that's what I've always enjoyed. But basically the way I even went down that path in the first place is I like meeting new people. I want to go jump on calls with people that I meet from newsletters, LinkedIn, Twitter, whatever. Um, got to the point where more people wanted to talk than I could handle. I started charging for it. And then I would charge like $300 for an hour long call, right? Uh, almost all those calls were about how to go and quit your job and what to do afterwards. And so I was like, okay, I'm having all of these calls. It's $300 a piece. I'm just going to do like, do exactly what I'm telling every single person on these calls. And I'm going to package it up and sell it for $100. So I think that mindset, reframe, shift, whatever you want to call it, um, at least helped me kind of have the confidence to go and put it out there too. Yeah, and I, I love how you mentioned you just love talking to interesting people. I think we're very similar in that perspective. Mm -hmm. I could literally talk to a brick wall. I'm sure people who have listened to all the episodes have heard me say that a million times, but I, I just love talking. I love meeting people. I love interacting with people. So it's cool that that was where that kind of offer stemmed from. Um, moving away from that, you have this amazing real estate portfolio, $5 million in storage right now. Um, what has that kind of journey been like? Where, yeah, I know you said your partner had a little bit of a real estate background, but still, I mean, you're relatively young, acquiring that much real estate in a short period of time is a huge accomplishment. I lo I'd love to learn more about it. Yeah, so we bought our first property September of 2021. Um, found it in a Facebook group. It was gonna sell it in seven days. We flew down the next day to Dallas, Texas, sold the property, offered 400,000 cash to buy it, uh, and closed up seven days later. And I think anyone who's listening to this that owns real estate is probably gonna say that's the most absurd story to close on property that you didn't know about uh, in seven days, but it's how it happened and how, it's how it went down and we ended up buying it from a wholesaler. Uh, so they already had title open and all of that kind of stuff. Um, from there, we spent pretty much the next year just getting really freaking good at operating self-storage facilities remotely and so we ended up buying more bought about four uh and once we bought that fourth one we were like okay we should buy a team now. or not buy a team build a team um and so after we bought that fourth we pretty much spent that whole year getting a little bit of of a portfolio together becoming world class in terms of operating and managing these facilities and we said great let's scale it up now so we brought on an operations manager we brought on a head of acquisitions and we just now hired three acquisitions associates as well uh from doing all of that we then are now like pretty much about two years into the business almost two years uh as of september and our plan from here is pretty much just go and scale this thing to the moon so it's really just about finding mismanaged properties mom and pop shop that are kind of in that sub-institutional like $1 million range roughly um, and just taking them over, 
running them like a business, you know, taking the owner's cell phone number off the side of the building, putting in a call center, like creating a Google listing, setting up a website, accepting credit card payments, like managing the actual property the way that it should be. And anyone with common sense would want to go and manage it. Uh, and then slowly realizing that equity. I think the thing that maybe not a lot of people know about real estate is like, let's take an e-commerce business. You make $1 in profit for a year for e-commerce business. You can sell that business for $3. It's a you know, three to four times uh, profit multiple on a lot of these businesses. A lot of real estate will go and trade at like 15 to 20 times profit. Uh, it's just how it works. It's, they're called cap rates instead. And so instead of a multiple, uh, you do an inverse of what's NOI divided by overall purchase price. And that's your cap rate. So take an example that we had for our first property we bought. We ended up going and uh, the number's going to be off here because I pulled up some of them in my head. But basically it was doing about $4,000 a month. Uh, we already bought it for probably less than it is actually worth. Uh, so we bought it for $400,000. We got revenue up at that facility to just shy of $10,000. And then we reapproached the bank and we said, hey, we're now doing almost $10,000 a month at this facility. What do you think it's worth? Uh, and based on products and different uh, property comps in the area, they said, well, we would appraise this building at 1.25 million. So then we were able to go and pull out a loan at 50% of that uh, purchase price or not purchase price, appraisal value. Uh, and it was, we pulled out $540,000. So the nice part about that property now is bought it for 400, appraised for 1.25, got all of our cash out and plus an additional $100,000. And now that thing still cash flows every single month. Um, and so our pretty much game plan for all of these properties is go in, buy under market, stabilize it at an actual valuation that it would be worth and then realize that equity and keep on 1030 wanting it to future properties man that's that's awesome like that's really 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 big at your age to do all of these things like with your business partner and to go through and i'm sure there's real estate gurus hosting big sessions who have not had this type of success so i mean it's just amazing is it is it easy to find mom and pop storage units like is is that no. has that been simple or not really no not really hundreds of calls a week running google ads and then postcards sending mailers like we just do the blocking and tackling and every few months we find some good ones awesome and you think real estate's gonna be where you shift like fully or you i know you have those two e-com brands um how's your time spent 50 50 between real estate and the e-com brands or 70 40 or that's no, bad no, 70 30 you're good uh i would say it's i would say it's pretty equal um in terms of yeah where is be spent personally i think running and operating businesses is more fun I think it's a little bit more creative i like the dynamics i like the fact that there's infinite scale whereas like let's be honest that one property that i just described to you like we're not going to be able to get past like twelve thousand dollars a month for example um unless we just build more storage and so yeah i think the fun part about business is that one month you can make a hundred thousand dollars and then the ne very next month you can make three hundred thousand dollars um that's really cool to me and so in my mind i like spending my time 50 50 but no i would definitely probably steer a little bit more towards the business side got it i i agree i tried to dip my foot in the real estate world pre-covid and me and my buddy just like you i have a friend who is a little bit of a real estate background we wanted to buy college housing just because mm -hmm. there's so many big colleges in florida mm -hmm. and we we they we got our offer approved we went into escrow we were about to buy this 2-2 in gainesville for like seventy one thousand dollars, and there was renters already like and all the other units in the complex around the college. And then things started to get a little weird. And the AC unit was 15 years older than what they said it was when the inspector showed up. A lot of little knickknacks. And, and we bailed. We like kind of freaked out. We bailed over like 7,000 extra dollars. Yeah. The units, the unit sold two weeks later for 84. And then now I think sold like six months ago for 120. And we were going to buy this three years ago. Um, so, I mean, a gr another great learning experience, but it's, it's, I mean, like what you just described, like doing the work, getting out there, like finding the right properties. Like, I think for us, we just didn't do as much as we needed to. And then we just weren't educated when the moment came to like take the opportunity. We didn't know enough, freaked out. And then now looking back, it's like probably shouldn't have nickeled and dimed over a couple grand there. So I think I think that's a big learning for me too. Um, it's it's an education thing, right? When in terms of like making decisions and where the risk actually lies, right? Like you guys bailed because you thought it was too risky, but you thought it was too risky because you didn't know what the property was actually worth, right? Like it's an education thing. Um, I think with real estate in particular too, like that first deal that we did because it was $400,000 because it was all cash and like we weren't taking a loan out at all. So it's like each myself and my partner were throwing in like probably 220 each, 200 each for the actual property and then some working capital to fix it up a little bit. Um, we were also getting cold feet before closing, right? And like this is a home one, home run deal in hindsight. 
where I'm telling you, like, it just appraised for 1.2. Home run deal. We were getting cold feet right before closing because we are like, we don't know what we're doing. Is this actually a good deal? Like, should we go and be putting in all of this capital into, like, buying this thing that we've never done before? And I think the question that reframed it a little bit in our heads was, if not this deal, then what, right? If we're not buying this property, okay, that's fine. But what are we going to buy? And because we both knew that we want this. It's something we've talked about for the last six months. But like, we want to buy a deal. If we weren't going to buy this one, what one was going to come along that was going to be better than this one? And we thought about it for like an hour. And we were just like, no, I guess that's probably it. Um, and thank God we did because it ended up really giving us the confidence to then do the next deal. And like now when we see deals come across our desk, we can kind of pencil them out very quickly and know what is a good deal and what is not much faster because we've had the confidence to do it once and we have the education of having done it now for the last two years. Yeah, I think the good, the the number one takeaway here is do your homework one, but take the leap of faith. If you can financially take that leap of faith and you think that it's smart, having cold feet, being scared is normal. Like you probably never spent that much mm -hmm. money on one single thing. Go in and just give it a shot. I think real estate's super important. I will be investing in real estate for the next 30 years of my life or more. Um, so it's it's great to hear your perspective from like, the um, storage unit side, and and it's it's all great. I saw that you had said you've been on 120 podcasts or 120 plus podcasts, which is which is awesome. This is maybe putting you on the spot a little bit here, but what's the biggest thing you've learned from all of these experiences? I mean, 120 podcasts, multiple speakers, multiple questions. What do you think is the biggest takeaway that you've learned from these experiences? Um, so, okay, I mean, I'll give you a couple of things that just come to mind, like right off the bat. One, I think that the happiest people I know have the highest sense of agency. And so what I mean by that is that Anybody who feels like they are in control of their life and their decisions are like hands down the happiest. And I find that that's often very true with a lot of entrepreneurs and people who run companies because they feel like they can allocate their own time, their own capital, their own you know emotional stakes, whatever, into the things that bring them fulfillment. So I'd say that's the first thing. The second thing is going to be like a little bit more like red and fluffy, but I just believe it's so core to my being. Um, the majority of those episodes were people that I've interviewed. So we used to run a podcast, haven't done it in like seven plus months at this point, just because I was like traveling a lot and wanted to work more in the companies. Um, there, I would say there were like three types of podcast guests in particular, right? So there's like uh, the C rated guests where it's, they're not like good. They're not good at talking and they don't do interesting things. There's the B rated guests where they're good at talking, but they don't do that interesting of things. And then there's the C rated guest, or sorry, and there's the A rated guest uh, who they're good at talking and they do interesting things, right? Um, like I think the biggest takeaway that I've learned is just like people who are high achievers, people who get a lot done in life, just intrinsically just want it. And I don't know if like if it's just the cliche of like winners win, um, but I I don't know how to quantify it, I guess, and I don't know like what the separation is or whatever it is, but I, that's just been like the truest thing for me is that like people who want things more and like are willing to put the time and effort in get the result. It's never the smarter people or the people that went to the ivy league schools or the you know people who are just like naturally so charismatic whatever it's almost always just people who just spend a stupid amount of time doing something that end up getting the results um so i don't know i i, I find find a lot of comfort in that fact. Yeah, no, I mean, those those are amazing answers. And I mean, I think I think this episode has been just absolutely amazing. So many different key points that people can take notes from and, and, and learn from you. You've accomplished so much in a short period of time. And that says a lot about you as an individual. It says a lot about your drive, determination. Um, so I, it's, it's really been an honor to have you on the show. Something I like to ask every guest as we come to the tail end is simple. Connor, what are you excited about in the near future? Right now we're hiring a CEO for one of our e-commerce brands. So uh, awesome. I'm really excited to kind of learn how to do that and go through that hiring process. That's awesome. That's, that's a unique answer there. It's really exciting, huge step for you and your businesses. Um, just maybe a little side question, like what are you looking for in a CEO? That's a good question. Uh, so we just got 600 applicants over the last day and I was wow. all, all morning trying to go through it. So like I've, we narrowed it down to 25 now. So I have a lot of interviews in my future. Um, the tough part that I've realized is we are, we have a small team. So whoever we hire for the CEO role, they can't be like a CEO of a 500 person company in the past. Mm -hmm. Like, cause those people are great at strategy and organizational planning and recruiting, but we need somebody who can roll up their sleeves and kind of 
do the work. Um, so like in my mind, a CEO who ran a small business in the past is going to probably be the main criteria. You know, it's big enough where they can set strategy and grow strategically, small enough where they're not afraid to roll up their sleeves and jump in Shopify or Klaviyo if something breaks last minute. Amazing. That's that, that that's great. Um, where can people follow you? I want to make sure anybody listening can go and interact with you and follow you on this journey. Yep. It's at C underscore G-R-O on all platforms, Twitter, Instagram, wherever. And then uh, I wrote a weekly newsletter at biz, B-I-Z, brainstorms.com, where it's just me sharing different business lessons and ideas and things I find interesting. Perfect. And all of that is going to be linked below the newsletter, the how to quit your job and not run out of money um, offer, and then all of Connor's socials. Connor, I really appreciate it. This has been an amazing episode. I look forward to continuing to stay in touch and getting to watch you on this journey um, and continue to succeed. And thank you so much for taking the time to come on. Of course. Thank you, Andres. 